Hello and welcome back. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. We're delighted to have you joining us for our third and final session of The Future of Human Connectivity. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Facebook, Nokia, and Qualcomm for their support of today's program. We've heard from the FCC chairman today, tech innovators, 5G experts, city officials, and more. Now you'll get to meet some of the people at the forefront of innovation in our ultra-connected world. They're designers of cutting-edge wearables and fast movers. Before we get started, though, a friendly reminder. You can join the conversation by tweeting us at hashtag TheHillConnects. We are broadcasting live and we'll be taking your questions. Again, if you do experience any trouble with a live stream, please refresh the page. That should do the trick. And my producer wants me to stop saying that it does not work. We'll see. My next guest is founder and CEO of Lumia, an e-textiles company crafting materials used in wearable technology and more. She is a Forbes 30 Under 30 member, and she is fusing the worlds of tech and fashion. Welcome, Madison Maxey. It's great to be with you. Um, I've been reading about Lumia. I'm fascinated, you know, wearables, the, you know, heating uh, 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 elements. But why don't you describe in your own words what Lumia does? We've been talking about this whole new hyper-connected world where you know, there, it's not just the internet of things, but we are connected to that. And you're the first entrepreneur that I'm speaking to that really is making something of that. Great, well, it's such a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for having me. Um, you know, I, I think especially when we talk about wearables, we're talking about the final use case and the outcome in the product. And something that we really focus on at Lumia are the core materials. So we focus on ways to make things that are soft and flexible also behave like circuitry. And, you know, of course, things like 5G are an important tool in making connected devices. Our materials are also an important tool in making connected devices. So we're really excited to be doing our part on the material side of making these products more of a reality. Can you tell us, can you walk us through some of the products you've developed and, and, and you know, maybe uh, uh, share with us the, the context for them and, and what products you're bringing online and where people can buy them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I think one thing is that, you know, my background's in fashion. A lot of people think e-textiles and they think fashion and they think apparel, but our best applications are actually not in the fashion space. Actually now exclusively on, you know, not working with fashion companies. So with that, most of our customers are industrial customers, um, some automotive customers, and I can't share too much about what we're doing for them. Um, but I think one really cool example of an e-textile that you use every day is a car seat heater. It's generally a wire attached to a very flexible substrate. So there's lots of things in our daily lives that already take advantage of soft, flexible circuitry. And the better that we make these materials, the more that we can do, whether that's, you know, better steering wheel heating, better car seat heating, um, better industrial, you know, uniforms or industrial robotics and are able to add sensing to them. Um, you know, another category is outdoor wear. So better heated jackets, better heated gloves. I think all of these things really benefit from um, from good foundational e-textile products. You know, I think it sounds like a fascinating world and I don't mean this in any um, critique or negative way. Sometimes I feel like I need digital free days. You know, I go use cash, I leave my cell phone at home and I have a 2001 uh, GMC truck that has no you know, trackable devices in it. And I just feel like getting away. Do you feel like we have to make a trade off um, as we move into this world of connectivity where lights come on when we're there or you know, our clothes warm up in certain conditions that, that you know, is, you know, is, is there something that we're losing about ourselves and our privacy and all of that, that that we should worry about or am I just an old fogey? And you can, you're welcome yeah, to say that. <laughs> I mean, I'm a millennial, but I, I don't understand like the TikTok. I'm not on a lot of social media. Um, personally, the applications that we're most excited about really aren't meant to attach you to a screen. You know, you can make a heated jacket that's controlled by an iPhone app that forces you to look at your screen more, or you can make a heated jacket that has a simple button to turn it on. So that you keep your head up. And we're definitely a fan of more of these screenless user interfaces as much as possible. Mm. So I, I think that with um, thoughtful design, you know, we don't have to make a trade-off. Um, I, I have a sample actually of our material here. Oh, that's very cool. Okay, let's let's pause here. Let's pause. What, what is this? 
So this is our multifunction demonstrator. And what the demonstrator does is it shows off three functionalities that we can get into a really thin, flexible, you know, circuit substrate. So you can see we have some lights here. Uh -huh. We have heating. Uh -huh. Oh, it's reversed. We have heating over here. This gets to about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we have a capacitive touch area here. So in the capacitive touch area, you know, when you touch the material, it changes the function of the lights. So, you know, this is just a demonstration of the materiality and functions that we can develop. But, uh, you know, nothing here needs a screen. So I think that there are definitely applications that don't force us to be m more connected than, than we already are. You know, I found, found it fascinating, and I know that you're also, you know, have thought a little bit about how some of these devices can be useful in the healthcare space. What are some of those applications? Yeah, I, um, there are quite a few, or one of my favorite, I should say, and this isn't a project that we've worked on, but uh, are these sleeves for, um, for muscular stimulation? So if you have some sort of paralysis or disconnect, basically, between your nerves and your muscular response. So, you know, thinking you want something to happen or feeling something on your skin and not having it actually make your body move. There are these really cool videos, the sleeves that you put on where your muscles are stimulated by the wearable in order to give you back your function, in order to close that loop. And I think that that's one of the coolest examples in wearables of something that you couldn't do with another device what you could do with a wearable, that's really adding to quality of life. It's not, you know, just like a nice add-on um, that isn't necessarily helping anyone. Uh, I also think that wearable EKG is a really great example. You know, a, a friend of mine when I was in college had um, heart issues and every day she had to wear all of these patches all over her body that were really uncomfortable and, you know, hard, hard to use in a lot of ways. So just having a shirt that you can put on that gives you those medical readings, I think is, you know, a simple example of how you can make something better for a patient by having it in a more wearable form factor. You know, years ago, and I guess I'm able to say this, is that um, Intel Corporation had this kind of special place that you could go look at stuff they were playing with. It wasn't necessarily something they were going to bring to market. But they had, you know, what intrigued me, so I'm gonna give them credit, but I don't know what they've done since with this technology, is that they had a rug, and that they, they found that you could leave a rug in a, in a person's home, and that by knowing that person's um, behavior and walking on that rug, they could tell when that person was likely to be building up to a stroke. And I just found it the weirdest thing, like I didn't understand the technology or how it happened, but it really impressed me that that's also a different form of interactivity with technology in our everyday circumstances. And, and I guess the, the, the question I have there is, how, are, is there a clearinghouse for these things? Do you go to a club of like smart wearables? You know? How do you all know what's kind of you know, cooking, if, if you will, out there? Because this happened, this was years ago when I saw this and I said, wow, this is gonna be a very different world. And I don't think we're there right now. I think if I mentioned a rug that people walked across it will tell you when you're having a stroke, many people would be very surprised. But some of the things that you're showing right now are very much in that ilk. And so it just feels like the future is here, but many of us don't know it yet. Oh yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the most confusing things about the wearables or e-textile space is that, you know, these products feel very familiar because they're often textile based or like a rug is a great example. So you see a demo, a demo working and you think that it's solved and it's ready. But in reality, you know, these demos are often held together by, by some chewing gum and they're not really ready for production. So the process of getting something through to production and used by a general consumer, I mean, it, it can take years. It takes a really long time. Um, and so because of that, there's kind of this gap between what we might see a demonstration of and what actually is going to work in our homes and for our own personal needs. So, um, you know, in terms of what's possible, I think, you know, of course, looking online is a great place to see use cases or events like what you went to. But when it comes to what's actually going to get to market and what's, you know, what are the you know, beachhead applications for this industry, I think it's all about looking at the core technologies. You know, if you look at something online and 
you know, nobody mentions the battery. It could be plugged into a wall. And until you actually fix the battery size and function, it's never going to be something that's portable and easy to use. So there are all these kind of like stop gaps from things actually getting fully to market. But um, I think the industry is really working on it. Groups like IPC and ATCC, which are standards agencies, are all working on standards around this space. And as we get more standards, you know, the easier it is for things to get to market. And, you know, you mentioned the club where these people are. I think they, I've met so many people in this industry working on standards. So it's kind of a cool place to be on the foundation of something. Are you marketing and selling these products now? I should know that before I started interviewing, but I don't. Are you selling things at this moment? Yeah, so we, we don't have a product on the market. The way that we work is that we customize our patented technology for other companies. And so we create a part that goes into their use case, and then they bring the product to market. So because a lot of the applications we work on are more on the industrial side, they take a really long time to go to market. So it's a little um, so bit we'll like it's it's a little bit like <laughs> Lumia inside. That's exactly what it is. You know, we've said we we want to be like the Gore-Tex of you textiles, that that part that is part of the final product, but you know, we don't make the final product ourselves. So what is the best selling product that you're inside right now? Yeah, a lot of the products, um, you know, again, because they're industrial applications, they're, they haven't come to market yet. Uh, we spent about three years working on the research and development for the product. And it was really around the end of, or the beginning of last year when we started working on these integration scopes. So for example, if you want something to be in a car, it's four to five years from starting the project to actually get it in a car. So I wouldn't be able to tell you the best selling product because we're, we're not in something that's on the market yet. Well, look, we're in a time right now where, you know, I'm in a, in a, there's a time of like great trauma in the country, right? We have, we, we spent a lot of time talking about the economic hardships, the health hardships, vulnerable communities, the racial protests going on in the country. But you know, when I talk to innovators out there, they're sort of scrambling and, and many of them, I mean, many, not all of them, many of them are just changing so rapidly. And, and, and um, we're doing an event with The Hill tomorrow called, you know, it's gonna focus on small business. And I almost hate the term small business. I wanna say new business, fresh business, ventures, you know, things that are there because I don't wanna kind of, you know, look at this. But in, in these times of crisis, I just like to, you know, get in your head, have people hear how you are innovating in this kind of traumatic moment, if, if any of this stuff is hitting you at all. Oh, yeah, it absolutely does. So, you know, we, we work on projects with other companies and a lot of big companies and their innovation budgets go when there are times of crisis. And that's, you know, that's how we get brought on to a project. So it's definitely impacted us. And, you know, the first thing that we did when we saw how long term these impacts could be was we started thinking, OK, what if, you know, what if we always wanted to do that we never have time for? And so we started actually developing a new set of products um, that's meant more for a maker and an engineering market that hopefully we'll be able to, um, you know, bring out sometime next year if all of the testing goes well. But we just tried to look at it as an opportunity to develop something that we normally just wouldn't have the time for because we'd be busy with you know, our customers and working on things for them. Um, but, you know, I think your note about small business is also really interesting because it's a small business can have you know 99 people. To me, that's that's not a small business. That's not necessarily new either. So it's yeah, it's, it's very interesting how those definitions can be so misleading. So just a final <laughs> question because I'm fascinated with people who really create new stuff. Um, do you know? Do you have any things that you're going to be thinking about trying to create five years? I mean, I know you've done this stuff now and you're going to try to move this in. But what's the next wave of, of the Lumia contribution to society? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I, I hope that at some point, you know, if, if we do well and, we, you know, we have the opportunity, it would be great to actually go and make those products that you've asked about. So, you know, not just work through other companies, but at some point, you know, maybe make that, you know, heating jacket that, that we've talked about so much or that medical sleeve, you know, make, make the whole thing. So I think that that's the long term in the future. If we had all the time and money, that would be a cool thing to go after. Well, sign me up. I love the name Lumia. 
Uh, so Madison Maxey, founder and CEO of Lumia, thank you for taking this in because, you know, again, I, you know, I think the, the, the connectivity that we have of lots of gadgets and things to each other is also going to include us and you're an entrepreneur in that space. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate it.